Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we are very excited on the behalf of the Division of Pediatric Cardiology. Um, we're very excited to have our first visiting speaker um, and visiting professor for the year. Dr. Miyamoto has been with us now for um, a day and a half. She'll be here with us for two days giving talks and meeting with people throughout the division. Um, Dr. Shelley Miyamoto is a professor of pediatrics and the Jack Cooper Milliser Chair in Pediatric Heart Disease at the University of Colorado. She is a true triple threat in academic medicine. Um, she's internationally recognized authority on pediatric heart failure and cardiomyopathy. She's a leader in our field in clinical and translational research. And all the while her file is full of teaching accolades um, and mentorship awards. Most of her uh, NIH-funded work um, focuses on heart failure in children with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, as well as fracturing the notion that pediatric and adult heart failure are molecularly similar. So her lecture today will give us some insight into the latter, and please give a warm welcome to Dr. Shelley Miyamoto. Well, good morning, and thank you so much, Magna. That was very kind um, and generous introduction. I also want to thank um, Ann Dubin for the invitation to come uh, talk to everybody today, and I've just had a really really nice day and a half. It's You guys are really lucky. You've got a wonderful faculty, and I've had a good time meeting uh, with people. So I'm uh, the talk, as uh, Magna mentioned, uh, does the shoe fit adult guideline-directed medical therapy in the failing pediatric heart? But I hope there's messages in here for pediatricians. Um, all of us take care of children with unusual and uncommon conditions, so I think there might be some themes here, I hope, that are, that are useful. I don't have any disclosures. So the objectives of the talk this morning will be to, to first review the outcomes and the existing evidence basis um, for the contemporary approach to how we treat children with heart failure. And then I'll describe some age-specific findings um, in the pediatric failing heart from our lab and actually some work that Megna has done previously. And then review a cell-based model system that we're using for the mechanistic study of pediatric heart failure and tell you the story about how we, we came to that model. And then finally, in the last few slides, I'm going to change tracks a little bit and just discuss some of the challenges and opportunities as I see them for child health research going forward. So this really underscores the overarching theme of this talk, which is that if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science, not an art from William Osler. And I really feel like in pediatrics in particular, this is a really um, impactful statement and really appropriate statement. Um, I think personalizing medicine is, is obviously coming along quickly, but in pediatrics in particular, I think this is an important um, premise. So there are really stark demographic differences between children and adults with heart failure, and many in the, in the room know this, but um, certainly the most common etiology of heart failure in adults is ischemic heart disease, whereas in children, we're dealing with patients who have various forms of congenital heart disease and various forms of cardiomyopathies that then lead to heart failure. When you look at the age, uh, the most common ages of patients with heart failure, adults are over the age of 75 when they present with their heart failure, while most children are less than two years of age. Of course, there are, there's heart failure that occurs across the age spectrum in both populations, but these are the most common um, age ranges. The other really big difference is the, is the lack of comorbidities in children with heart failure and the really prominent presence of those comorbidities in adults with heart failure. So about half of Medicare patients, uh, Medicare, uh, Medicare covered adults with heart failure have four to six comorbid conditions and a quarter of adults have more than six comorbid conditions. We're talking about things like diabetes and hypertension and obesity and metabolic syndrome. Those almost certainly have an impact on how these patients respond to the therapies that we're providing them. Whereas in, the mo in most children with heart failure, they don't have comorbid conditions. They're dealing with heart failure and that's really their primary problem. So when we think about how we get the evidence to, to develop um, treatments, there is just an absolutely robust body of literature when we think about evidence for the treatment of adult heart failure. And that's where this guideline directed medical therapy comes from. So this was a really cool study where they looked at um, the randomized control clinical trials that have been done in adult heart failure over this 15-year time frame from 2001 to 2016, 118 randomized control clinical trials, over 215,000 patients enrolled in these adult clinical trials. Each trial had almost 1,000 patients. I mean, this is like mind-boggling numbers to someone like me because you'll see what we've done in pediatrics. 
And then when you look at what they've studied, there's, you know, drug studies are the most common studies in, in pediatric heart failure, but they are in adult heart failure, but they also look at invasive studies such as ventricular assist devices and defibrillators and, and, and things along that, those lines. And then non-drug therapies, exercise, nutrition, um, these are these are all things that are being very, very systematically studied in the adult heart failure population. Okay, so keep that picture in mind. And now when we think about what have we done in the world of pediatric heart failure when it comes to randomized control clinical trials, I'm going to blow you away with our three studies that we've done. So this is this is these are the three really, I think, in my opinion, the three kind of true randomized control clinical trials we've done in pediatric heart failure. This is it. And this is this spans a time frame kind of the, from the early 2000s to this most recent study, which is um, the Entresto study at the bottom there, um, which has not even been published yet. So in these three studies, look at that N number there. We vary from 116 patients up to 360 patients. We'll talk a little bit more about the Carvedilol trial um, in a bit, but suffice it to say that in the Carvedilol trial, which was the first trial we did, it was funded by GlaxoSmithKline, published in 2007. We enrolled 161 patients and it was symptomatic heart failure, children with symptomatic heart failure from all etiologies. We had single ventricle hearts, we had dilated cardiomyopathy hearts. What we learned from that trial is that ventricular morphology matters. And that was kind of the theme of the talk I gave yesterday to the division, uh, but it, it makes a difference. We, can't, we probably cannot treat patients with single ventricle heart disease and heart failure in the same way that we can treat children with dilated cardiomyopathy and systemic left ventricular heart failure. So then subsequently, you can see what happened with the trials. These patients with single ventricle heart disease have been excluded, and now we're just focusing on patients with dilated cardiomyopathy in these randomized controlled clinical trials. When you look at the results, two of the studies were neutral. The Carvedilol study and the Entresto study were neutral. The Ivabradine study, the primary outcome was whether or not the drug decreased heart rate. That's the purpose mm -hmm. of the drug. So yay for us, it works. <laughs> But we didn't, we just don't have the numbers to be able to look at whether or not we're, we can improve heart failure related morbidity, heart failure related hospitalization. Can we delay or avoid transplant? Can we improve survival? We just don't, we simply don't have the numbers to be able to do that. But if you look at the randomized controlled trial results in adults, these drugs, all three of these drugs very clearly have decreased mortality and decreased morbidity in, in adult heart failure. So what do these drugs do? So the goal of the current adult guideline directed medical therapy regimens is to reverse remodeling. So what does that mean? When we think about remodeling, we usually think of that as a positive thing. This took me a long time actually to get my head around because I think of remodeling a house, that's a, that's a very happy, good thing to do. But in the heart, remodeling is bad. What that means is that the heart gets dilated, that left ventricle gets dilated, the walls get really thin. And then when you think about it from a perspective of looking more closely at, at the, the cell, what's happening at the cellular level, we get cardiomyocyte hypertrophy and there's fibrosis. These are all bad things. And the goal of the guideline-directed medical therapy in adults is to reverse that process. So the medications that are the cornerstone of adult GDMT right now are ARNIs, so that's that Sacbuterol, Valsartan, Entresto drug, or an ACE inhibitor. So something that targets the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone pathway that's mediating that pro-fibrotic process. Beta blockers, which we'll talk a lot more about. Mineralocoid receptor antagonists also target that fibrosis pathway. And then SGLT2 inhibitors is the newest class of drug added to the, the guideline-directed medical therapy. This is originally was a diabetes drug been really effective in um, treating adults with heart failure, and in fact, may end up being the first drug that we have in adults to treat HEFPATH for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction diastolic heart failure. So that's a really promising drug. Has not been studied at all in children, although people are using it anyway, which is always a little tricky. And then diuretics are used, of course, just for congestive symptoms. Okay, so this is kind of the cornerstone of what we're trying to do when we're treating adult heart failure. And this is just another way of looking at how important these drugs have been and how impactful these drugs have been in the adult population. Every, anywhere from a 15 to a 33% decline in mortality in adults with heart failure. This is no joke. I mean, this is really, really important stuff and, and has really improved outcomes. And you can see that even more clearly in this study, which I think is a really good way of looking at this. On the x-axis here is the time from diagnosis of heart failure in adults. And then on the y-axis is survival from all-cause mortality heart transplantation, or placement of a ventricular assist device. And what they've done is they've divided this into era. And as each era goes along, we're adding more and more drugs 
you know, and even most recently, again, we've added these SGLT2 inhibitors to adults. And you can see there's a statistically significant improvement in outcome with each era. So this black line is the 70s, the red line is the 90s, then you've got the 90s to the 2000s, and then the most contemporary era up here, this purple line is 2005 to 2016, and you've just gotten better and better and better. When you look at five-year survival after, trans or after um, diagnosis of heart failure, more than 90% of adults are alive five years after their diagnosis of heart failure. Not only are they alive, they're, they're, they have not been transplanted and they don't have a ventricular assist device in place. So that's pretty good, especially when you look down at what was happening back in the 1970s where that, that, that transplant-free survival was much, much lower. So really great improvement. Okay, so what about in children? Well, you'll recognize a couple names um, on this paper here. There's <laughs> Dave Rosenthal and Ann Dubin both contributed to this work back in 2014. This was um, the, the most recent set of um, guidelines for the management of pediatric heart failure. There were 23 recommendations for the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So that kind of heart failure you're talking about with dilated cardiomyopathy, the heart doesn't squeeze well. There were zero level A recommendations, meaning we had no recommendations that were supported by randomized controlled clinical trials, none. There were seven level B, but thankfully Dave and Ann are experts and we had 16 level C recommendations. Now these recommendations are really, they're, they're, it's extrapolation from, and I have to implicate myself here too, because of course I helped, I helped with this as well, but you know, we didn't, what, what are we supposed to do? We're, we're extrapolating from adult clinical trials. We just don't have the evidence in children. So we use our best judgment and we say, this is the best that we think we can do. And we develop these guidelines based on extrapolation from the adult clinical trials. And I think this is, the, this is the best that we can do. So the question is, okay, is the best that we can do working for these children? Well, you can guess the answer to that. So I want you to focus here on this right-sided figure. This is, this is children with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. The, the left side is familial dilated cardiomyopathy. The numbers are pretty small. The story is similar. But really, we want to focus on idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. That is the most common cause or a common indication for heart transplantation in children. And this is really the most similar disease process from a phenotypic perspective to the adults that are being treated with these drugs. This is a similar graph to the one I showed you with adults. It's just arranged a little differently. So time from diagnosis of heart failure is on the x-axis, and then proportion with event, either death or transplant, is on the y-axis. The two lines to compare are the blue and the red. So the blue is 1990 to 1999, and the red is 2000 to 2009. So presumably in the, in the 2000s, we've gained something, right? We've, we've got more ACE inhibitor use. We've got beta blockers. Um, we've, we we're trying to, to be more aggressive in how we treat these children and treating them more like we would treat an adult with heart failure. So when you look at this, you can see that there actually was an improvement in, in death. So there was less death in this most recent era of children with heart failure. When you look at the transplant line across eras, there really is no difference. So we haven't improved our ability to delay or avoid transplant, but there is improved survival. But look at it this way. When you look at the death rate in the most recent era at five years, and you look at the transplant rate at five years from the diagnosis of heart failure, uh -huh. there's about a 50% death or transplant rate at five years. So that's compared to that more than 90% survival rate of, of adults. We're just not doing nearly as good. So even though maybe we've made some improvements here with survival, we're not making overall um, dramatic improvements. And these numbers here, this 50% death of transplant rate at five years after diagnosis, that's actually even worse than adults were back in the 1970s. So we're really lagging behind here. So why is this? Do we think that children may be responding differently? to adult-based based therapies. So, you know, of course, I think that's, that's certainly possible. And the outcome studies that we've already discussed really show how our outcomes are lagging. And perhaps some of these adult-based therapies are not as effective in children as they are in adults because there is this growing body of evidence that maybe there are molecular differences in the failing pediatric heart that could be, um, could, could and should be leveraged to try and identify different therapeutic, therapeutic targets that are more age and etiology specific. So let's talk a little bit about the Carvalhol trial, because this is really kind of where our work initially got, got started and kind of having this idea that maybe kids and adults are responding differently. So I mentioned the Carvalhol trial was, was published back in 2007. It was funded by GlaxoSmithKline. The incentive for GSK to, to fund the study was a six-month patent extension on Carvalhol, which was obviously a very, very effective drug in adults. 
Carbetalol is a non-specific beta blocker. There are two main, and we'll talk about this more, but there are two main beta receptors in the heart, beta one and beta two. Carbetalol blocks both. Beta one selective blockers such as metoprolol are also really effective in adults with heart failure, but carbetalol is even more effective. So this really is kind of the, the, the drug that people go to. When we did the pediatric study, it was, I already told you that it was a neutral study. So we didn't find any difference in children who were treated with carbetalol versus placebo. But again, we only enrolled 161 patients and that took five years to do. So it really was kind of a long process. So the conclusion from the study that was carvedilol did not significantly improve clinical heart failure outcomes in children and adolescents with symptomatic heart failure. We didn't meet the primary outcome measure, which was a composite measure um, of, of heart failure outcomes. But there, was, there, were, there were lessons we learned from this. And I think this was a really important trial for a couple of reasons. One, I already told you about the ventricular morphology issue, which children with single ventricle heart disease actually tended to do worse with carvedilol. And the children with dilated cardiomyopathy tended to do better, but they weren't, we, we weren't, weren't powered to be able to look at that adequately. But we did learn that lesson. And I do think it's important to think about ventricular morphology when we think about treating heart failure. The other lesson we learned was that there was a lower than expected event rate and a higher than expected spontaneous improvement rate in the patients in this population. So trying to identify ways to design clinical trials in a manner in which we can enrich the population in that clinical trial for the children that we think may be most benefited by these therapies, I think is something we have to keep thinking about going forward. And, and people like Chris Almond are really doing great work thinking about how do we develop cl clinical trials in a different way where we can use smaller numbers and still see an effect. So the bottom line is at the time that, that this trial came out, I was actually a junior faculty working in a lab right next door to Mike Bristow's lab at the University of Colorado. And Mike Bristow is one of the people who kind of, you know, developed this idea that beta blockers would be helpful for pediatric heart failure. And, and there were two of his faculty, also junior faculty at the time, we just happened to be sitting around talking about this trial. And I was explaining to them how carvedilol was not, didn't, you know, we, this was a neutral trial. And they really didn't believe me because they both were just, they were trained by Mike. Everybody thought beta blockers worked in all, in all patients with heart failure. And so we came up with this idea to try and explore this using our cardiac biobank. So we have a pediatric and adult cardiac biobank at the University of Colorado that contains hearts from adults and children that are undergoing heart transplant. We've had this for probably since the late, mid to late 90s, since we first started doing pediatric transplant at the University of Colorado. So families and, the, and children are consented and assented to donate their heart to our biobank. And we have over, I would say, over a 95% um, rate in getting these, these families to agree. They all are, are more than willing. It certainly doesn't delay the surgery. The heart comes out. We have a research team that goes into the operating room, collects pieces of the heart tissue, and then we can store them for future use. So we have this big bank that we could rely on to try and do some of these studies. So to just kind of give you a little bit more background on the beta adrenergic system and, and this rationale behind why beta blocker therapy works, I'll walk you through this, um, this cartoon here. During the syndrome of heart failure, when someone has heart failure, there's increased circulating catecholamines, increased circulating adrenaline. That stimulates both the beta-1 and the beta-2 receptor. This is Part of this is similar to that fight or flight response that we all um, have experienced when you have increased adrenaline and you start mediating effects through this very uh, beneficial and compensatory pathway, this green pathway up here. Uh, through the beta-1 receptor, when the beta-1 receptor gets stimulated, cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, and we start getting phosphorylation of calcium channel um, proteins, which then can augment contractility, improve cardiac relaxation, all really good things. So initially in heart failure, this catecholamine response is compensatory and, it, and it's beneficial. The beta-2 adrenergic receptor, we actually know a little bit less about, but really it's, it's really this pro-survival anti-apoptotic pathway. So it's kind of a good pathway. We like that beta-2 pathway for the most part. What we know happens in adults with heart failure is that the beta-2 receptor is, is preserved, and I'll show you data that, that supports that, but that beta-2 receptor doesn't really seem to be affected, but the beta-1 receptor, it's getting, getting hit by those catecholamines over and over and over, and that eventually leads to internalization and desensitization of that receptor. And what starts happening is instead of this positive, you know, encouraging green pathway, we now go down this, this red pathway where CAM kinase gets activated. And CAM kinase then dephosphorylates some of those calcium channel regulatory proteins like phospholamban. And it starts mediating that remodeling effect that I was talking about where the heart gets big and dilated, cardiomyocytes increase in size, there's apoptosis of the heart cells, there's fibrosis. 
So the idea is behind beta blockers, if you use something like carbetalol, you block both the beta one and the beta two adrenergic receptor, and you kind of put a stop to that CAM kinase um, pathologic pathway. So that's the, that's the kind of concept behind beta blocker therapy. So what do we know about the beta receptor expression in children? That was the question that uh, my two collaborators, and these are two people that I, I value very highly and collaborate with to this day, Brian Stoffer, who's an adult cardiologist at the University of Colorado, and Kika Sukarov, who's a brilliant molecular biologist at the university. She's the real brains and science and scientist behind this, this work. I can bring the clinical questions, but without Kika's help, it's, this, is, this is really true team science. So our hypothesis was that maybe there are age-related differences in the beta receptor um, expression pattern that could explain the difference in, in response to beta, beta blocker therapy. And so again, we went back to the tissue bank and Kika knew how to do this. I had no idea, but Kika says, we can actually look at beta receptor expression in the hearts of these patients. And so we went and decided to look at children under the age of 12, because we don't really know when a child when a child's heart starts acting like an adult heart from the, from the perspective of heart failure. So we kind of went pre-pubertal, took the hearts from children that were under the age of 12 and were very focused in looking at only idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy hearts, no congenital hearts, no single ventricles. And we compared those to what we considered the apples in the adult tissue bank, which were idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy hearts, not ischemic hearts. So these are idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. So as best we could in apples to apples comparison. Donor hearts that we can use here to look at kind of age matching as best we can to understand how, the, how pediatric hearts may differ from adult hearts at just the baseline level. These donor hearts come from potential organ donors whose heart could not be placed because of size or blood type mismatch. Okay, so we do have a few of these, I think probably now 30 or so of these non-failing pediatric hearts. So this is what we found. So in each of these um, graphs here, the, the pediatric hearts are on the left, the adult hearts are on the right, the clear bar is the non-failing control hearts, and then the black is the idiopathic dilated hearts, children and adults. In this first figure here, the total beta receptor, if you just look at all beta receptors in the heart, both in children and adults with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, there is a decrease in the beta receptor expression. When you break this down by subtypes, we can look at specifically beta-1 and beta-2 receptor. Again, children look just like adults in this beta-1 receptor. Both have downregulation of that beta-1 receptor. And that's that, you know, we're really just recapitulating what has already been shown in adults for many years. But now we're showing in, in children that also that beta receptor is downregulated. But when we get to this beta-2 receptor, that's when we started seeing some interesting differences. The beta-2 receptor, as I said before, is preserved in adults with heart failure, and we showed the same thing, but the beta-2 receptor is downregulated in children. And remember, that's that positive kind of in, that um, anti-apoptotic pro-survival pathway. So what does that mean? Well, there does seem to be this differential pattern of beta re receptor expression in children and adults. And what does it mean that that, that good beta-2 receptor is downregulated? Well, the hypothesis we came up with was that maybe there's a threshold that we need of this beta-2 receptor expression. And if we block that beta-2 receptor further with a drug like carvedilol, maybe we're blocking it below a point where it's beneficial. And so now we're starting to get some detrimental effects or maybe we're just not seeing the positive effects of carvedilol. So to explore that, we developed an animal model, which is not a perfect animal model by any means, but we took mice, young mice, which were around four weeks of, four weeks of age and then older mice, and we implanted an isoproteranol infusion pump. So basically just gave them a bunch of catecholamines to induce this um, kind of catecholamine induced um, cardiomyopathy. And then we gave them, we exposed them to different beta blockers. And our hypothesis was that maybe adults, you know, these older mice would respond to beta one and non-selective beta blockers, just like in the clinical trials, but that in children, carvedilol or non-selective beta blockers would not be a good thing because we're dropping that beta two Express that beta two activity below a, a, a threshold, but maybe children would, or these young mice would respond to just a beta one selective blocker. So in the experiments, what we used as our output was heart weight, body weight. So with isoproteranol, you get hypertrophy of these hearts. And you can see in the old mice and the young mice from that white to that yellow bar, that's an increase in the heart weight, body weight. So the heart got thick and it was unhappy when it was exposed to isoproteranol. In this first experiment here, we gave the, the isoproteranol mice carvedilol. And what happened is what's in this black bar here. So in the, uh, in the old mice, just like we see in clinical trials, heart weight, body weight comes down dramatically. But in the young mice, there was no significant difference. So we did not see 
heart weight, body weight change with exposure to a non-selective beta blocker. But when we gave the mice metoprolol, which is a beta one selective blocker, both sets of mice benefited. So you see a decrease in heart weight, body weight in the adult and a decrease in heart weight, body weight um, in the young mice as well. So I told this to the division yesterday, don't act on anything I'm saying today. I'm just, this is all, I'm not saying to use, because people ask me all the time, should we just use this beta one selective blocker in children under the age of 12? I don't know. Um, I'm just, my, my point is just, I'm trying to raise awareness that I think we need to think about these things, you know, and maybe there are ways we can do registry tri studies or, or something that we can try and get at this better, but I wouldn't act on a mouse study to treat children, but it's just kind of food for thought. So what about other aspects of remodeling of, of the heart? You know, we talked about hypertrophy. We talked, we talked about fibrosis as other targets of adult guideline-directed medical therapy. So what happens in the pediatric failing heart when it comes to that? Well, there's a couple of studies um, that suggest that children may have less fibrosis in their heart than adults. So we did this study with Casey Wolf, who was a postdoc in our lab and now is a, is a junior faculty. She does really, really great um, work actually looking at myofibril mechanics. But at this time, she, she did um, a study where she looked at um, children and adults with, again, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy and demonstrated that there's less fibrosis in the pediatric heart than the adult heart. And then my good friend, Magna Patel, did a really, really nice study with Corey Levine when she was at Wash U um, and, and found the same thing. So this was really encouraging to us that we're seeing the same thing um, in two different labs. And actually, at that time, I had no idea that Magna and Corey were doing this work. So it was really cool because we both were finding the same thing. But, they, but basically, what Magna and Corey did is they looked at, again, donor hearts, a pediatric and adult, and then dilated cardiomyopathy hearts and showed the same thing that there was less fibrosis in the pediatric heart. And they, they did this also by using a fibrosis score, which is, is a really elegant way of looking at this and more objective, looking at interstitial and perivascular fibrosis. And you can see on the x-axis here, as, as the patients get older, there's more and more fibrosis. Uh, but in the young patients, there just isn't as much. So these antifibrotic therapies, like you know things that are targeting the RAS system, uh, may not have as much efficacy in some patients with heart failure. I'm, there are children with dilated cardiomyopathy we know that have fibrosis, but this is just kind of a, a big, a big picture look. So, what about hypertrophy? Well, we know that cardiomyocyte hypertrophy is a hallmark of remodeling in adults, but this also differs by age. So, again, this was a, a study that we did in our lab with an MD PhD student, Bill Tapman. He did a really nice, nice job. This is a, this is a really nice paper, and then again, Magnus paper. Um, included work looking at hypertrophy of cardiomyocytes. And again, we found the same thing, um, unknowingly that we're doing this work at the same time. So pediatric and adult donors here um, in Phil's work, and you can see that the, the pediatric cells just look very similar to the, to the donor cells, whereas in the adults, you see these big kind of globular cells. It's pretty obvious. And when you look at, at Magna's slides, you see the same thing. So um, a lot of dilation, hypertrophy of these cardiomyocytes in the adult, but not in the children. So this lack of cardiomyocyte hypertrophy is another aspect of cardiac remodeling that really may be different in these two populations. We also, and I didn't show this data, but we also, my, one of the questions that I had when we were looking at this is time course. Like, does this just have to do with how long the patients have heart failure? And when we looked at time from diagnosis to time we got the explant, we did not find any correlation. So at least in the children, we didn't see that if you had heart failure for a year or five years or seven years, that you were more likely to have fibrosis if you had that heart failure for a longer period of time. That's not, we didn't see that. Now our numbers are pretty small, so I can't know that for certainty, but we did look, look at that and didn't see that. So to change tracks here a little bit, there's also this idea that, you know, are there drugs that maybe are working in children, but not working in adults? So the reverse could be true as well. And one of the drugs that, that has really always intrigued me is milrinone, which is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor. I'm sure most people in this room have used that drug and you've seen how dramatic it can really be in, in helping um, children with heart failure. Right now, milrinone, which is obviously an IV infusion is the only PD3 inhibitor that's approved for use in the United States. Mike Bristow actually many, many years ago developed an oral um, phosphodiesterase inhibitor called anoximone, but that really never went anywhere. And part of the reason it never went anywhere is because of this study. So the PROMISE trial was um, a study of chronic milrinone therapy in adults with heart failure. And actually it showed that you, there was a 34% uh, relative increase in cardiovascular mortality in adults who were exposed to milrinone. So that's not good. So trying to make an argument that, that a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor would be good in adults is hard to make when you've got all these drugs that are decreasing mortality and now you've got this drug that's actually increasing mortality. 
in our kind of anecdotal and small series experiences, there's, there's a few publications of milrinone use um, in children that have been treated with pretty chronic milrinone, weeks, months even, um, as a bridge to heart transplantation. And we just don't see the same um, concerning side effects. We can definitely see, and I'm sure the intensivists here have seen it, you can definitely see arrhythmias with milrinone, but it's pretty uncommon. And I know I personally have bridged many, many patients to heart transplantation on months of milrinone kept them at home and we don't put an ICD in or even send them home with a life vest. And we have had not one, knock on wood, not one single sudden cardiac death from milrinone. So it does seem to be a fairly safe drug in children. So how does milrinone work? Well, again, we've, we've got catecholamines that are driving the activity of these beta receptors. And initially, again, that's, a, that's an encouraging and a compensatory response. And I wanna, wanna bring the focus here this time to this, um, to this green pathway here where you've got cyclic AMP, that's activating protein kinase A, which is phosphorylating calcium regulatory proteins like phospholamban. And that is augmenting contractility and augmenting leucotropy. Again, what happens over time with chronic stimulation of the beta receptors, that beta one adrenergic receptor gets downregulated. We start shunting things through the CAM kinase pathway. You get a decrease in cyclic AMP because you're no longer um, augmenting that pathway. And so then no more PKA, you get dephosphorylation of phospholamban, all the bad things. So the idea behind a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor is you, at least you, look, what you try and do is inhibit phosphodiesterase 3, which is an enzyme that breaks cyclic AMP down into 5' prime AMP. So if you can at least prevent cyclic AMP from being broken down into 5' prime AMP, the idea is that you get, you get a little bit of an increase or augmentation of that cyclic AMP present in the myocardium, and that can help kind of drive things in a, in a positive direction. So that's the idea is can we augment cyclic AMP levels in the hearts of these, these patients? That's the philosophy or the rationale behind PD3 inhibitors. So what really happens? Well, what, what really happens is, is shown here. So this is again, non-failing hearts this time are the black column, failing idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy or the white, children are on the left, adults are on the right. And you can see that in both populations, there is a decrement in the cyclic AMP levels in the myocardium of these patients with heart failure. So that's what we would expect, right? We decided that if you've got chronic stimulation of the beta-1 receptor, you, you start going down that CAM kinase pathway and you get decrease in cyclic AMP, which is a bad thing. So what happens when you take tissue from children and adults with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy that were treated with milrinone at the time that they were undergoing transplant? Okay, so now these patients here were not treated with milrinone. This next group of patients was treated with milrinone or anoxamone in the case of the adults. There were some patients that were on anoxamone, but they're treated with a PD3 inhibitor. What we would hypothesize based on what we just talked about is that the cyclic AMP levels should be higher in the patients treated with milrinone. And that is what we saw in the children. We did see this augmentation of, of cyclic AMP and partial recovery of the cyclic AMP levels, but in adults, we did not see that in that adult tissue. So remember what the consequence of increased cyclic AMP is, it's activation of PKA, and it's phosphorylation of that calcium regulatory phospholamban. So we wanted to look and see, do we see an increase in the phosphorylation of phospholamban in these hearts of children um, with dilated cardiomyopathy who are treated with norinone? So the first thing we did was just look at untreated hearts. And sure enough, you've got a decrease in the phosphorylation of phospholamban in those hearts of children and adults that are not treated with a PD3 inhibitor. But when you add that PD3 inhibitor treated um, myocardium to the studies, you see that uh, you do get an improvement in phospholamban phosphorylation. So this would suggest that potentially there is something to this, that children and adults may respond differently to PD3 inhibition. But in this case, the children seem to benefit, the adults not so much. The challenge here, and I've talked to Dr. Bristow about this many times, is, well, can we bring back anoxamone for children? And that is much harder, <laughs> that's much harder to do than it seems because you do, you know, we've got such a small market and Chris Allman and I were talking about this yesterday. It's just, it's a small market. So trying to convince a drug company to develop or produce a drug for such a small market is a really difficult thing to do, especially when there's been this, all this evidence that suggests that the drug is, is detrimental on adults. Then there's this, you know, not the hope that maybe they can find a bigger market. Uh, so it, it really is challenging. So what could be driving these differences um, in, in how the pediatric heart adapts to heart failure? Um, we've, we've tried to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that, and we started to look at some um, gene expression in children and adults with dilated cardiomyopathy. And really, this is an attempt to kind of understand the mechanisms underlying pediatric heart failure and generate some hypotheses about areas that we should be exploring in the future. 
So this um, was part of Phil um, Tabman's study that he did, and, and he did RNA sequencing, again, of idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy hearts. And these are all, the genes are all compared to age match controls. Okay, so you take an adult idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy hearts, you look at their gene expression pattern, you compare that to non-failing control adult hearts, and what you see in this blue circle here is the differences between adult failing and non-failing. These are upregulated genes in the top Venn diagram and downregulated genes um, in, the, in the lower diagram. And then we did the same thing for children. So age match controls compared to dilated cardiomyopathy, look at the gene expression, where are the genes differentially regulated, and then upregulated and downregulated, and look at the tiny number of genes that overlap between these two populations. These really are just very distinctly different disease processes, even though when you look at an echo, they look really similar. The pediatric heart's dilated, it's thin-walled, it doesn't squeeze, just like the adult heart, but there's all these different levels um, that just seem to suggest that that's happening in, in a different way, that we're getting to that endpoint in a very different way. We've looked at some of the pathways that, are, that could be informed by these differential gene um, expression, and it just there's, there seems to be this very unique profile um, in the children. There's, there's upregulation of genes that are associated with de-differentiation and the fetal gene program. There's downregulation of genes that are associated with cardiac function, hypertrophy, um, and apoptosis. So again, really not, you know, this is really just kind of characterizing this, this heart tissue and trying to, to understand what hypotheses we might be able to generate um, down the road to, to try and identify some, some alternate therapeutic targets. So while characterizing these in-stage hearts is, is helpful and I think has been somewhat informative, and at least at the very least, I hope is thought provoking um, for everybody, we really are struggling to find ways to identify evidence and to, to really explore mechanisms. And we can't perform the invasive mechanistic studies that have been done in adults with heart failure. Dr. Bristow has done some amazing work when he, when he first started doing the beta blocker work. He actually did this really cool experiment where he, not experiment, but study where he would biopsy the hearts of adults with heart failure before and after beta blocker therapy. And he showed that the fetal gene program was repressed when the adults were treated with, with beta blockers. I mean, really cool stuff. We could never do that in a pediatric population. And we've already talked about how difficult it is to do randomized controlled clinical trials in a rare population. Animal models are challenging in, in the pediatric population. There's not a lot of non-ischemic um, pediatric dilated cardiomyopathy or congenital heart disease um, models that are out there. So in order to get at mechanisms of disease, we really need to find some models that recapitulate what's happening in the, in the human heart. Well, we, we've been working with a model that was um, that has a pretty cool story behind it. It was inspired by some work that was done by Leslie Leinwand. So Dr. Leinwand is um, a molecular biologist who um, is at the University of Colorado up in Boulder, and she's got a really strong interest in, in looking at physiologic and pathologic hypertrophy of hearts. So physiologic hypertrophy, meaning athletes, um, exercise-induced hypertrophy, which is a good kind of hypertrophy, and then pathologic hypertrophy. And she's really got an interest in sarcomeric um, variants and the hypertrophy associated with sarcomere variants. Well, Leslie went on a trip to Burma, and she was on a tour, and a tour guide was telling her about these Burmese pythons. And the tour guide told her that Burmese pythons, they, they eat um, very rarely, but when they eat, their heart increases by 40% in size after about two to three days after their meal. And she, of course, was fascinated by this because this is right up her alley. Like, this is true physiologic growth. So she literally came back to Boulder and developed um, a python lab. So she has got snakes, and it's the coolest thing, but she's got these snakes in this lab, and she decided to kind of see if she could use this as a model to look at physiologic hypertrophy. Um, the postdoc in her lab at the time that, that's the first author on the science paper that came out of this several years ago is C Cecilia Requiem, and Cecilia um, was the postdoc, the only postdoc in Leslie's lab that was not paranoid of these snakes, and so she's the one who got, who got the job. So they did these experiments where they proved this, right? They 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 had hearts before um, the pythons were fed, and then three days after the pythons were fed, and there's this 40% increase in size. So in an, in an effort to try and understand why this was happening, um, Leslie and, and Cecilia took serum from these fed pythons. And what they did initially is they took neonatal rat ventricular cardiomyocytes. Okay, so this is a really um, helpful model that we've used for a long time. Neonatal rat ventricular cardiomyocytes are primary cardiomyocytes. They put them in a dish and they put some of the serum from these fed pythons on these cells. And what they saw is the cardiomyocytes got really big and they had increased protein synthesis and all these, these cool things. They also took 
serum from the fed pythons and they injected it into fasting pythons and they saw the same effect on the heart. So they didn't feed the pythons, they just injected this, this serum, the fed serum into fasting pythons and they still got the heart size to increase. So there was something in the circulation of these pythons that was driving this hypertrophy. And eventually, to make a long story short, they found out that there were these fatty acids in the serum that were responsible for this physiologic growth. So again, I already sang the praises of Kika Sukra, but she's the one who came up with this idea of let's try this, you know, let's try this in kids. So let's take serum from children with heart failure and treat neonatal rat ventricular myocytes with it and see what happens. And the idea is with those myocytes, you can do gene expression studies, you can do functional studies, you can do mechanistic studies. And our hypothesis was that maybe there are circulating factors in the, in the serum of children with heart failure that could be causing um, and propagating some of this disease process. So the first experiment we did was pretty simple. We just took serum from normal, healthy children and serum from children with dilated cardiomyopathy. We put it on cardiomyocytes and we looked at pathologic gene expression, BNP and ANF. Both were increased in the cardiomyocytes that were treated with the pediatric heart failure serum. So this kind of supported our hypothesis that maybe there is something in the circulation of these children that's propagating this disease. So we've done quite a bit of work trying to identify what it is in the circulation. That is not an easy answer. It is not fatty acids. Um, but we've been trying to figure out what it is that's in the patho pathologic gene expression response that's driving that pathologic gene expression response. And I'm just going to show you one of the one of the things we've done that's kind of interesting, but certainly needs more work. We started looking at exosomes um, within the serum to see if that could be part of what's driving this response. Exosomes are these tiny little nanovesicles that are secreted by a variety of cell types. They have a role in paracrine and autocrine sim signaling, but they're, they're little, they carry all these things. So there are these little packages that can carry microRNAs, mRNAs, proteins, long non-coding RNAs. And they can deliver these, you know, these things to other cell types. If they can get into that cell, then they can deliver their package. So what we did is we took um, the serum from children with heart failure and we isolated uh, the exosomes. We isolated this exosome pellet. We proved that we had exosomes by using uh, microscopy, this, this laser beam microscope, which can measure the size of these exosomes and can demonstrate, we can count them. And then we can also prove, okay, we've got these 40 to 100 nanometer um, size particles. Then we labeled them and we treated cardiomyocytes with the exosomes. And when you look at this time dependent, this time course here, you can see that as time goes on, more and more of these exosomes get in to the myocytes. And by 24 hours, you've got a pretty robust increase inside the myocytes with these exosomes. So are the exosomes causing some of this or contributing to some of this, um, this pathologic gene response? We think so based on this experiment. So site D prevents the exosomes from entering the cardiomyocyte, okay? So it prevents exosome uptake. And so when you look at the, the figures down below, if you don't put site D on these cardiomyocytes, you can see they light up red. When you do add site D, the exosomes cannot get into the cardiomyocytes and the, the, the signal here is much lighter. When you look at ANF and BNP expression, you can see that when you don't put site D in, you get ANF and BNP is elevated. So the exosomes are driving this pathologic cell response. When you add site D and don't let the exosomes in the cells, this line here is the non-failing or control line for ANF and BNP expression. And you can see that uh, the exosomes now cannot get into the cells and the cells are not expressing this pathologic gene response. So perhaps there's something inside these exosomes that is contributing to this pathologic response. Um, we haven't figured out what that thing is, but um, this is pretty encouraging that there is something in the circulation that could be contributing uh, to, this, to this heart failure phenotype. So where do we go from here? Um, you know, perhaps anti-remodeling agents and medications are not the only answer for children with heart failure. Um, age and etiology of heart failure are important factors in the identification of appropriate therapeutic targets. Certainly, I think I'm, speak, I'm preaching to the choir here that children deserve focused study, um, that we really just can't make assumptions about how they're going to respond or how they're, you know, how any, it, whether it's any disease process, not just isolated to the heart, they really can have unique differences. And we maybe shouldn't just be relying on adult-based data. But funding and drug development are challenging um, due to the rarity of these disease processes. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's where I wanted to just spend the last uh, couple, couple slides here. So, you know, to, to do the work that we need to do to really focus on um, 
investigating pediatric specific heart problems, we need to encourage people like Magna and other clinician investigators that really have an interest in, in doing this work. And it's hard. It's really hard. And it's hard because funding for pediatric research is, is pretty, pretty marginal and it's just not getting better over time. There was a there was a journal issue in JAMA Pediatrics a few years ago that, that I would encourage everybody to take a look at. And I maybe it could be updated because this is now you know four or five years old. But basically, they looked at um, NIH pediatric funding specifically. And what you see here is, is in 2000, um, in an attempt to increase pediatric funding, there was um, this Congress enacted this Children's Health Act, which authorized an, authorized an expansion and intensification of pediatric focused funding. And so you can see in this graph, there is this increase in funding in, related to pediatric research, but then it kind of flatlines. And in the the left-sided y-axis here is billions of dollars. And we've, you know, it's just been total NIH funding has been around $30 billion when you account for inflation with the pediatric funding being this dark box down here. And then when you look at the right-sided y-axis, this is the percent of NIH funding that's dedicated to pediatric research. It's varied between 10 and 12%, you know, for years and years. So it's really just, we're not really making much change here. I looked up the most recent numbers and, and you can see here, and again, this accounting for inflation, I don't think there is really any difference here, but about $6.9 billion goes to NCI, $3.8 billion goes to NHLBI, only $1.7 billion goes to NICHD, which is really supposed to be kind of the home for, for a lot of pediatric funding. Of course, most of us in this audience would think of going to NHLBI um, because we do know that they've got bigger and deeper pockets. When you look at pediatric funding by NIH site, or by NIH Institute. So this is all of pediatric funding. Where does the, where does the funding come from? Well, NICHD, even though it's kind of supposed to be the home for pediatric um, funding, only, only provides 18 and a half, 19% of the, of the funding, NIH funding for pediatric research. It really comes from all these other areas. And then the percentages just get tinier and tinier and tinier um, with NHLBI um, providing you know, less than 10% of funding for pediatric research. When you look at pay lines, um, things have things got really pretty dire around 2015, where the the priority score for a K award um, was down to 16. It's better now for NICHD at 24, and the pay line uh, priority score for a K award now at NHLBI is around 28. But an R01 is pay line is still 15 percent, which that's really really difficult. Um, so when you're you know a pediatric researcher trying to compete with all these adult you know, heart failure and adults, cardiovascular grants, and the pay line's 15%. It takes many, many, many tries. So that is difficult. The other thing that's happening is there's, and, and this isn't new either, but there's just quite a bit of contraction of where pediatric research is being done. 63% of pediatric R01s are granted to 15 institutions. And you can see Colorado and uh, Stanford are kind of back to back here with, with pediatric funding. But really, there's just, you know, as a clinician investigator and someone who wants to do research, it's hard to go anywhere outside of, you know, some of these institutions because this is really where that work um, is supported and, and being done. And then when you look at the number of R01s by specialty, this is really striking to me. In pediatric cardiology, at least as of the time, the time this was published, there were only 36 pediatric cardio cardiology R01s in the entire country. That is less than one per state. So really just, and I'm sure if you look at adult numbers, it would just blow these out of the water. So really a very, very difficult, um, difficult problem. So, you know, we, I think we've talked today, uh, I hope I've convinced you that outcomes for children um, certainly are lagging and that we really need to continue to focus on studying uh, pediatric patients as best we can and really thinking about novel clinical trial designs in addition to some of the preclinical and, and mechanistic work that's being done. And then, you know, just doing all that all that we can and all the roles that we have across the country here to really advocate for pediatric health funding. And some of that's going to depend on um, also, you know, partnering with philanthropy, partnering with patient and family advocacy groups that are interested in funding this work as well. We may not be able to rely entirely on the NIH. Um, and of course there are other funding um, opportunities. But I'd, I'd also just like to add a little plug that I think to truly support emerging clin clinical investigators, you know, people like Megna, we really need to be purposeful in what we're doing, and that's really hard, but we need to make sure that we are effectively um, putting in place mentorship and sponsorship programs and holding people accountable to that. Um, we really need to make sure that we're identifying strategies that help 
people that are clinician investigators balance their time better. You know, if they're spending all of their time doing clinical work, it's really, really hard to, to do this research. And so we need to find ways that we can strategize to balance that time better. And then really importantly, we have to put time and money and effort into making sure that they have some of the support they need, such as research study coordinators and regulatory support and making sure they've got, you know, people that can help them write the grant so that they can write a, a competitive grant and they're not trying to do it just at nights and weekends when they're tired and, you know, really starting to get frustrated. So I think providing, you know, these kinds of supports for, you know, our promising junior and mid-career faculty is really, really important if we want to keep moving child health research um, forward. So that's my soapbox and I'll get off now. But anyway, so thank you all very much for um, your time and your attention. I'd be happy to take a few questions. If anyone's ever in Colorado, I'd be happy to show you around our beautiful campus. But this is um, our team in the Pediatric Cardiovascular Research Lab. And I absolutely could not do any of this without all of them. So they really deserve the true credit. But thank you very, very much for your time. So there's a couple of questions um, here. I'll get to one and then I'll, I'll let you go. Well, the first question was, what was the name of the PDE3 inhibitor that was used in adults but not currently available? It's called anoximone, E-N-O-X-I-M-O-N-E. -E. And just kind of a little side note, Dr. Bristow still has belief in this drug in some ways. He has some really cool data that suggests that there are some genotypes, the PDE3 genotypes that may allow him to to kind of understand which adults with heart failure may respond to PD3 inhibitors and which may not. Um, so that's, I, don't, I think he's published that. I'm not totally sure. But that's pretty, that's pretty good data. Question? Uh, uh, very informative uh, presentation. So do you know offhand roughly the percentage of pediatric population with heart failure falls into dilated cardiomyopathy, idiopathic, and Structural heart disease. What's what's that breakdown, roughly? That's a good question. I, what I what I can tell you is that you know when you look at the percent of children that are enrolled in these studies, it's about a third of the children had congenital heart disease, and two thirds had dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, there are better numbers out there um, than that, but I you know that's probably about the breakdown that that we've seen. I think that number is changing though, as we have gotten better and better at survival in our single ventricle population, and we have this growing population of ACHD, I can tell you in my experience and looking at my weight, our wait list at children's, it's about half and half now. So I think that we're starting to, to change. But I would say it used to be, it was probably a third, two thirds. Yeah. And early in your talk, you made a distinction between the two in terms of how they respond to certain pharmacologic therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the most, the most, I think, um, the best example of this is Carvalol. So in the Carvedilol study, we enrolled children with dilated cardiomyopathy and children with any form of congenital heart disease. As long as they had symptomatic class two or greater heart failure, they could be enrolled. And when they did a sub-analysis looking at the response to Carvedilol, the children with dilated cardiomyopathy and a systemic left ventricle tended to respond to Carvedilol, not statistically significant, but tended to respond. Whereas when you took the patients who had a single right ventricle or a systemic right ventricle, like congenitally corrected transposition, those patients actually tended to get worse with Carvedilol. I didn't go there, but we have looked at beta receptor expression and some of the signaling pathways in the single ventricle heart, and it's very, very different. So there's like three groups of patients. There's what the adults do with their beta receptor expression pattern and their signaling pathways. There's the pediatric dilated cardiomyopathy signaling pathways. And then there's the single ventricle systemic right ventricle patients, and they look entirely different. Yeah. Right. So it, is there any subpopulation of structural heart disease with left ventricles, like tricuspid atresias mm -hmm. or Schoen's type patients Do those, even though it's, it's the left ventricle that's failing rather than the right, do those act like the dilated cardiomyopathies or is it too small the numbers? It's too small numbers in the Carvedilol trial to break that out. We've started to look at that a little bit. Um, and I would say that in the very, very little that we've done, because we've really tried to focus on systemic right ventricles because it just gets messy, <laughs> just so many little small groups, that the systemic left ventricles look more like a systemic right ventricle. You know, and, that and they've, in, yeah. Right. And in healthy hearts, is the expression of the beta one and beta two pathways different between the right and left ventricles substantially? And a That's a great heart. question. It is different. Yeah. It is different. That's a great question. You know, we've not looked at beta receptor expression. Those beta receptor studies are kind of, they're pretty labor intensive. Um, 
And the person who used to do that was this technician we had. She was amazing, but she has since retired. So we'd have to train someone else to, to look at these beta receptors. It's a really good thought to look at, you know, at single ventricles. Because Mike Bristow did some work way back when looking at patients with pulmonary hypertension. And he showed that in the right, he showed the expression pattern in the right ventricle of, of patients with pulmonary hypertension, adults. That looked similar to what you see in a failing left ventricle. But looking at a failing single LV versus the failing, failing single RV is a, is a good idea. I was just wondering, you know, stem cell work has always pushed to create differentiated, fully differentiated cardiomyocytes. And for the longest time, you know, it's seen as a detriment to not be able to study adult hearts because you can't create something beyond a neonatal type cardiomyocyte. And I was wondering if any of your work has been utilized as a way to justify sort of studies using immature cardiomyocytes in the pediatric model, rather than seeing it as, as a deficit, but yep. using it as a target to study molecular mechanisms? Yeah, really, really great question. This is not my area of expertise, but we have used, we've actually, um, Dr. Wu came out and, and visited us several years ago, and, and we talked to him about this. He's actually sent us some cells that we've, we have used. We don't really have the infrastructure right now. We're working on it to, to think about using iPS cells more directly, but I, that's a, it's a great thought, and we have kind of talked about that. I think the concern is that I'm not sure people are convinced that iPS cells are even matured to the point that we can consider them pediatric. So, but it, it's, a, it's a good thought, and we can try and make that argument. You know, I think we don't know for sure, but using iPS, we, we're just so used to using neonatal rat ventricular myocytes and have, that, have done that for so long and have so much experience with it and think the output from that, you know, looking at gene expression has been pretty easy for us that we've kind of focused on that. But IP, we have done these serum studies with iPS cells, and you see the same thing. It's just that, you know, for us, we don't, we don't have that as much of a setup for that right now as others. What happened with the snake fatty acids? What happened with them? Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure. I think that she, if you look at that science paper that Leslie wrote, she describes which specific fatty acids um, she identified that were causing this physiologic growth. And I think she makes some speculation about how these could be uh, nutritional, you know, potentially nutritional therapies that people could, could use. Um, yeah, she's she, and she's continued to do some of that, some of that Python work. Um, let's see. So a couple other questions. How might parathyroid hormone differences in growing kids versus older adults impact calcium homeostasis in response to these therapies? Is this more about physiology than morphology? So diseases such as the George syndrome could be a contributor. Learning from rare disorders sometimes leads us to look at typical kids with viral cardiomyopathy and heart failure. I don't, you know, I don't know much about parathyroid hormone differences in children and adults. I don't know as though we've ever really looked. It's a really good question. Like I don't, parathyroid hormone is not something I've ever measured in children with heart failure, but it's a, that's a good question. Um, and then might pentoxifylline be a target to study in pediatric heart failure? I think there was a study of pentoxifylline back in, I think it was in Japan. Pan, and they were focusing on idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy and really small study. And unfortunately, what happens, I think we all see this in the literature, when we see these really small studies published, they're almost always encouraging. Um, but the question is whether or not, you know, would that hold up in a bigger population? And then since most of this, this is a great question, since most heart failure in adults is in the elderly, would it be reasonable to include adolescents and young adults in clinical trials? There's actually been quite a bit of effort because What's, what the adults are under, realizing is that their clinical trial population is also not matching real world heart failure populations, that the po populations enrolled in clinical trials in adults are actually younger and have fewer comorbidities. And so, you know, whether or not we should be including adolescents and young adults in clinical trials, I would say, yes, we should. Um, whether or not you can include children with and, and uh, adolescents with um, congenital heart disease, I think would be a harder sell. But those are great questions. All right, that's probably time. Thanks so much. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.